Well, we'll, we'll probably get into this as a theme, but the number one reason I, I the thing that I see the most is, is simply an aversion to change. Um, and I think more than even organizations, it's a human, uh, it's a human attribute. We kind of want things to be comfortable. We want things to stay the same. And so we talk at EXO, we talk about this organizational immune system response, the negative one that tries to kill change and kill progress and innovation. Um, is very good at it. Uh, but most of that comes from our, our sort of basic human need uh, to, to keep things the same and comfortable. And it's fundamental. So it's, it's, it's not in our nature. <clears throat> it's not in our nature to, to fight that. But that's the first. But then there are others that are less, uh, um, I mean, they're, I was thinking about this because you, you, you asked me before, and, and it's going to sound a little funny, but we have these uh, seven deadly sins, right? <laughs> Lust, gluttony, greed sloth or apathy wrath envy pride i mean this is what we see when we de when we do a deep dive uh into the organizational immune system response oftentimes um and so a lot of people don't want to see that either <laughs> in themselves or their company so uh, we have to learn to how to make those changes uh palatable uh yeah. for people um, because they they need to happen but uh, it's it, it, it's basic stuff. I mean, I don't think this is the digital age didn't invent something new there, right? We, we're people. I think when somebody makes the decision uh, consciously that they need the change or they want the change, uh, the digital transformation, uh, however you however you want to call it, this is there have been a lot of lot of names over the years for these things. The number one thing is to ask the right questions. Uh, and when you start a process of change, you've got to know why you're going to do it or else no one, and you've got to be able to communicate that or no one is going to, to follow you. Uh, and you can try to make them, but and you can if you're the boss, right? Like in a, in a company where you're the CEO, but it won't stick. You know, as soon as you take your eye off the ball, somebody will, they'll just revert right back. And so I think the, the, the really the number one steps are to make sure that you spend the time. Uh, and I believe uh, one of our colleagues, Tony, has written a book recently uh, very much about this, about the things that you have to do to make sure that you don't fail, <laughs> you know, and the, um, and I, I really think that it starts first uh, with asking the right questions, because uh, if you don't get that right, then you will get the wrong answers. <laughs> so, and that's just not not what you're looking for. Uh, these organizational changes can be quite jarring. They can be difficult. You can lose a lot of people um, uh, through attrition or uh, lack of fit in the new world as you go through, and you have to learn it. ways to deal with that as well. So, uh, it's just deeply important uh, that you prepare and that you ask the right questions. I think it's, if I'm going to pick between the two, <laughs> uh, it's definitely the last. Having the right mindset, uh, really pushing here as a cultural shift. Again, we said before, and this is said, I said this would be a theme, uh, people don't like to change. They like the what they've made and the culture they're in usually, even if it's bad, by the way. Sometimes people will choose the comfortable bad over the uncomfortable new uh, uh, quite frequently. So I think first definitely comes the mindset shift or the cultural change and one of the things we do uh, at EXO for both cities and companies are the fast tracks and the sprints those are the mechanisms by which we affect the mindset shift it's actually the most important thing in my personal opinion that those things do a lot of people focus on the outputs the the initiatives that come out the other end of those processes and those are great but the, the mindset shift the permanent mindset shift that can happen partway through those projects, usually around the disruption cycle, uh, are, are really, really incredible. Um, and the thing about technology, the technology part of the question, uh, it's not first because it's a tool, right? Uh, ever since fire, <laughs> we've used technology as a tool to accelerate our development. Uh, and that's true of a person or a community, a city, an organization, humanity. Uh, and the, the reality is that all technologies uh, are, are tools 
uh, to at least so far. Uh, you know, if, if the Terminator future, <laughs> you know, and all that comes to pass, maybe it's different, and then we become the tools or the matrix, right, or the batteries. But the, um, you know, for now anyway, uh, you know, these exponential technologies, the, just like we talk about with AI as an example, the most effective uses of AI. Kai Fu Lee wrote this uh, in his most recent book. Um, uh, the most effective application of exponential technologies like AI are when we use them to augment human performance, human intelligence. Uh, it's, it's truly outstanding what can be done. Re there was a mammogram uh, example recently uh, that was just released. I believe it was, I hope I don't say this one wrong, I think it was out of MIT, uh, where they actually started from the beginning trying to use the machine learned models to augment the radiologist's reading of volumes, just mass volumes of MRIs that they needed to do uh, for checking for breast cancer. And if you want to make sure that you're right, when you tell someone that they have breast cancer, well, it would be a good idea, right, to use the best technology you can find uh, to make that diagnosis. Uh, and what was amazing about that project was that was one of the first times I saw where they didn't say, oh, we want to replace radiologists. They said, no, we want to make radiologists amazing right and that's what they did and it's so that's totally gonna work okay um the mindset after the i'm a little biased on this one so i'll i'll um I'm, i've got a couple of couple of answers um you know number one i think we already said it uh, and I'll, I'm not going to rehash that, but it's that acceptance of change and that willingness to drive cultural mindset shifts, especially if you're in leadership. If you want to be an exponential leader, walk or talk that talk, then it's not going to happen for everyone who's trying to follow you, you know, diligently. Uh, so um, I think the number one thing uh, is that you have to be willing to accept the change. Uh, I mean, I, I'm on, I don't know how many careers I've had anymore, but the, uh, the reality is every one of them has been very, very different, uh, um, but all based on common. It, it's, it's, it's that thing, right? So it's that willingness to change. The second thing though, I think, you know, this is the biased part. Um, if you, you need to be able to master these technologies. Okay. So is it going to be okay uh, if you're an architect? I have my wife, by the way, is an architect, so we have this conversation frequently. Is it going to be okay if you're an architect to sit down with a pen, paper, and a ruler and do the house plans uh, for the builder? Paper and go, here you go. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and he's going to look at it and go, where's my AutoCAD drawings? You know, uh, and that's not new technology. <laughs> that's old technology. The new stuff is outrageous. People are now using artificial intelligence and data and generative adversarial network, neural networks to uh, to generate floor plans, for example, and then and have the the architect or the de designer look at the floor plans, architect or the designer. You can skip the person who has the bigger, more giant, more expensive degree because now the designer can just look at the floor plans generated by the AI and pick the one that flows best for human need. You see, so um, it's that ability to leverage those technologies. And the, where I'm biased is that I do a lot of my work in the implementation of EXO attributes in the area of algorithms. So if you want to look at the 10 attributes, the one that says algorithms, a lot of my work would be related to that in data, data science, data operations, building teams that can deploy artificial intelligence effectively. Uh, so I, I, I find myself a little biased there. Uh, but the, um, the reality is that's just one example, right? There's, there's, I think I just saw this thing called the periodic table of trend of, of a period, what was it? The periodic table of transformative technologies, or something like that. It was just just last night, so I haven't looked at it in detail. I'll have to dig it up. But the um, there were there were a lot, <laughs> you know. And data is like one little box on the whole thing. So uh, so I think I think understanding that as well is critical. Uh, this is a massive multivariate problem. So focus uh, focus is the key, and that goes all the way back to that very first thing about asking the right question. Once you ask the question and you think you have an answer, well, the thing, everything that you do after that is called science. <laughs> and we have the scientific method. So you need to prove or disprove your hypothesis. And you do it really quickly. And that's where movements like lean, where, you know, Palau was just in, uh, Francisco Palau uh, was just in uh, Peru talking about 
the uh, how the the connections between the lean startup movement and the EXO movement. Uh, so we've got all these incredible tools. Uh, we just yeah. All just related, yeah. It's, it's, it's a systemic, yeah, exactly. The systemic approach is, is, is critical. Yeah. Maybe that's a good answer to one of the earlier questions too, is to be successful, systems thinking is kind of making a comeback. And one of the best systems administrator manu manuals or systems engineer, ma engineer manuals on the planet is actually one of the original ones written by NASA. Uh, so I tell people all the time to Google the NASA systems engineer manual and read that to understand how you document and create a real system that can do an actual moonshot. <laughs> you know what? They did, right? That's why they wrote it. They went to the moon. Well, I'm not going to pick on any anybody or any particular company, but my answer to that is no. Uh, I actually do not think uh, they can all make that change. However, um, I do think that they can all leverage well, let me say the reason for that. The reason is just not all, all business is even has a need for it, right? You know, don't, you know, don't get the sprinkles and the whipped cream and the cherry and the extra flavors and all the stuff in your coffee. If you just want a cup of coffee, it's, it's just drink the coffee. It's fine. Nobody will judge you. Uh, you know, but the thing is that, um, uh, in, in fact, not everyone needs it. There's, we're still humans. We're, you know, we're here unless we are really in the matrix and, you know, I don't think we are, but uh, that's a whole other conversation about do we live in a simulation, right? That, that people like to have, but no, uh, I, I think that every company can make use of technologies and exponential technologies to dramatically, dramatically improve the work that they do with other people and for people and for whatever reason. Uh, but no, I don't think they all are going to, going to make the change to, you know, what we're thinking of as digital transformation to platform businesses that connect buyers and sellers. Sometimes you just need to be the seller and then you're a single-sided direct sales platform. It's totally fine. The world needs that too.